And so I'm very uh, delighted, I mean, that today we, we are able to hear directly from, from Nora in this uh, in conversation event with Professor Claire, Claire Gorada. So first of all, uh, let me introduce the two speakers of today, and then I will uh, just uh, uh, remind everyone of the few practical details about being on a Zoom event, although everyone uh, more or less is used to, to it nowadays. And so uh, Professor Nora Krug, is uh, the um, author and illus illustrator and associate professor uh, at the Parsons School of Design in New York City, where she explores the relationship between illustration, history, memory, and cultural identity. Her visual memoir, Belonging, won the National Book Critics Circle Award in autobiography. It was named as Best Book of 2018 by the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the San Francisco Chronicle, as well as The Guardian. Uh, Professor Krug was named Illustrator of the Year 2000, in 2018 by the Victoria and Albert Museum, and their visual narratives were awarded with gold medals from the Society of Illustrators and the New York Art, Art Director Club, and also included in the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, Krug is the recipient of fellowship from the Guggenheim and Fulbright Foundations, among others, and today she will be in conversation with Professor Claire Gorara, who is Professor of French Studies at Cardiff University, where she's also Dean of Research and Innovative Innovation for Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. She has uh, researched broadly in the area of visual cultures and has published work on popular ca culture and narratives of the Second World War in France, including recent work on photography during the deliberation period. She's currently researching comic books and graphic novels that addresses the intergenerational transmission of European memories of the Holocaust. And that's why she's here to talk today with Nora Krug. And so I will just remind everyone, as you're already doing, to keep your microphone, microphone muted throughout the event. And um, there will be time for question and answer after the 30 minutes conversation more or less between Professor Guerrara and, and, and Professor Krug. And you can ask questions directly in the chat if you, if you prefer, I mean, just write it there and then we'll monitor the chat and post the question to, to, to Nora. Uh, however, you're always welcome to raise your virtual hand and uh, appear on screen. If you want to do this, I just must um, remind you that the event is recorded. And so uh, just, Keep this in mind in case you, you, you want to appear on screen. And finally, I just need to thank Royal Holloway University of London and especially Harry, the Humanities and Arts Research Institute of Royal Holloway, which uh, uh, granted financial support for this event. And so we, th we thank Royal Holloway to make this event possible. Without further ado, I will just leave the floor to Professor Gregorara and Nora Krug. Thank you so much, Guido. That's a wonderful introduction, and it's, it's a wonderful pleasure to meet Nora here today. So as we've met today, Nora, yourself and myself, and we've agreed on, a, on an informal format, colleagues, today. We'll, we'll begin by maybe by, by Nora giving us maybe some of her observations and comments on, on, her, on her graphic novel, High Map Belonging. We're then going to have a look and discuss questions around history and representation, the question of generational memory. And then we're going to move towards questions around form and format, particularly the graphic novel, and obviously the very particular and innovative formats that Nora is using in her work today more broadly. But I, I wanted to begin by asking Nora maybe just to talk her through what drew her to writing about the Second World War and what was her jump point? And maybe by looking at some of the, the images from her text, she might tell us about her journey um, towards the graphic novel as the format for a very uh, complex, personal, but also collective and generational story about the war. So maybe if I can ask you to to maybe give us, as it were, some sense of that, Nora, from, from reading and interpreting your own, your own text. Yes, thanks so much for having me and for coming to this uh, event. I'm, I'm very much appreciating it. Um, so uh, the, the idea for this uh, book came about because I, I have been uh, living abroad for about 20 years at this point, and um, I've been living in the United States for almost 18 years. And um, as a German abroad, I, um, I felt myself, um, you know, feeling more and more German than I'd ever felt before while still living amongst Germans um, uh, while I was in Germany. And so uh, while living abroad, uh, I suddenly, you know, was able to look at my own culture from a distance and gaining new perspectives. I also felt the need to confront myself on a more personal level uh, with the subject of the Second World War, which is a subject that in Germany you learn obviously a tremendous amount about as a, as a school child and, and later on. 
Um, but uh, I realized only through leaving my home country and resettling elsewhere that um, most of what I learned about remained on, a, on an institutional and collective level, um, but that the personal investigation was missing. And I also realized that it had actually been a taboo. And um, I hadn't even realized that it was a taboo not to talk about what your own family had done or hadn't done under the Nazi regime or um, not to ask you, you know, to ask your friends about what their grandparents had done. And I realized that in order to to be able to um, to confront this subject in an honest way, I needed to go back into my family and ask some of the questions that I had not really thought about asking before. Um, and so that was the, the main idea that living abroad basically catapulted me into this uh, state of wanting to know more. And um, I'm a trained illustrator. Um, and so it felt very natural to me to um, tell a story with images or a story not only with images, but that is equally driven by text and images. Um, and I decided to write to write a book and to illustrate the book with a variety of, of forms. And I think we'll probably talk about the formal aspects a little bit later. I mean, that's, you used the word there, Nora, that word of emigrate. Is there a particular, in your sense, emigrate perspective? Because again, we could use, use many terms, you know, a memory archivist, emigrate. There, there are multiple terms for the narrative self in, in, in your text here. Um, do, they, do they represent, I suppose, different iterations of yourself, both, and, and the narrator, of course, both in Germany and abroad? Because a memory archivist is not the same as an, as an emigrate. Um, I wonder if you've reflected on the terms that you use for your, your narrative self. Yeah, I use the term emigre um, for pages in the book um, that, um, just trying to see if we have, if we can pull up one example, um, it would be, um, can we pull up image six please, so three further along, yes, uh, one back please, thank you. So for these pages that are called from the notebook of homesick emigre, things German, where I try to catalog um, objects, foods, places, environments that to me uh, feel, feel German or say something about my understanding of German cultural identity. Things that I remember as being deeply tied into my upbringing, my family, the forming of my cultural identity and worldviews, but uh, also items that were later misappropriated by the Nazis. So, all of these catalogued items uh, are very complicated. Um, and uh, they, to me, they represent the struggle between my trying to embrace my culture and the difficulty in doing so because of our troubled past. Um, and so I, I referred to the term emigre. Um, I mean, to me, yeah, it, in my case, obviously implies somebody who chose to leave, which is a very different situation than somebody who's forced to leave, obviously. Um, but also somebody who has this perspective from, from afar. And I think that's a, a common motif in my entire book is this, this idea, which I also represent on the cover and in other, in other moments in the book, this idea of turning around and looking back, um, you know, looking back both geographically, but also um, in terms of back to another generation. Um, and it's also in a way inside in a way, and it's, it's, a, it's a gaze within oneself. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that, that was my, my interpretation of that term emigre on those pages. And obviously on this page here, we, we can see the wonderful, you know, interaction between the drawn image, your handwritten text, and, and I, I, the scripting I find very interesting, and photography. And, and you do some wonderful work with both shaping, morphing, reconfiguring, contrasting photographic images with the more drawn hand or the haptic element of your writing. Were, were you always aware and, and alert to, oh, I'm sure you were, how you wanted the photographic, you know, the documentary, as it were, to align with the artistic and the drawn? Because you have it almost like a sort of Darwinian drawing of, of you know, the, the martial was like a specimen against a picture, I think, is it of your mother? And, and, I, and, I, and I think, I think it's, it's, that, it's that wonderful um, decollage that that not a mismatch but that, that the thinking the curious you know the reader is very curious as to the intersections did you think very much about how you put photography where you put it against the drawn image yes so i see the book as a as a collage not only a collage of images but also of thoughts and ideas and i think the the center narrative of the book is um 
it's a journey for lack of a, a better word. It's the journey of my trying to find out what my family did or didn't do under the Nazi regime, but equally it's, a, it's an investigation of what German cultural identity means to me and what it can mean, what mean, what it should mean, what it shouldn't mean. And those two things are very tightly tied together for me. So I wanted to capture this idea of a journey, of a visual diary, with, of a scrapbook, um, also of a family, uh, family photograph, uh, you know, album, photographic album. album. Um, and that, that was one idea for why I chose to juxtapose drawings with photographs, with found objects that I, that I collected at flea markets and antique shops uh, all over Germany. Um, but I also thought a lot about the nature of history and how we look at history, the term history, and also the nature of memory and how we try, you know, that memory being um, something that is really an accumulation of individually experienced moments that we try to then make sense of in retrospect. And we create our own narratives that are sometimes also um, untrue or, um, uh, you know, not, not um, really realistically represent how we experience certain events. Um, and I see memory as a process uh, of shaping and reshaping and constructing and deconstructing the past. Um, and so I wanted to convey this idea of fragmentation and reconstruction through those pieces, bits and pieces that I then arranged in a way that to me made sense conceptually and narratively. And the, the, the way I distinguish mostly between images and, and uh, I mean, illustrations and fo historic photographs was like, for, for instance, in this example, um, I talk about my grandfather's brother who vanished in Russia uh, during the year, uh, during the, um, during the war. And we still don't know what happened to him and where he died and how he died. Um, and I thought it was much more important. And, and these are his letters from the front line that he wrote to his wife in Switzerland. She, he was married to a Swiss woman and he had no interest in being a soldier. He uh, did not support uh, Adolf Hitler's ideology. He was, I mean, an example for somebody who, who was simply drafted into the war and the letters, you know, show that he was, he was miserable. And um, also he expressed an acknowledgement of the suffering of, of you know, the soldiers on the other side. And there's so much humanity in these letters that I felt it would be more important to create a more internal image of him as a person and, on, and of what he was going through emotionally. And that, that could be better done and would be more poetic by the use of illustrations where I have three uh, consecutive uh, images of his face that gradually disappears. And with the historic photographs, like the one we saw earlier uh, number in slide number two, um, where uh, it was important, often it was important for me, um, uh, could you go two more, two further back, please? Um, to convey a specific moment in history. So for instance, these photographs show the moment of forced, so-called forced confrontation, where Western allies forced German civilians right after the end of the war to go into the camps and witness what had happened there. And you can see the dead bodies in the background, but that I didn't want those to be the focus of the images. I wanted the focus to be the people witnessing this moment and the act of witnessing being such an important thing to do. Um, and also this moment of disillusionment, this moment when the German guilt began. I mean, the guilt that I still feel generations later, this is when it began at this exact moment. And you can see it mirrored in the people's faces. And that's what I found so fascinating about these photographs. They are reactions to looking at what the person they had supported for so many years had actually done um, and that them being complicit by supporting him. Um, and so that was an instance for where I used photography in order to, because I thought it was much stronger to show the actual faces as photographs than if I had redrawn them. Yes, and of course, and again, here is elsewhere, each photograph in some way is annotated by yourself. There's often a script or a cross or, or a mark on it, which makes the photograph, which prevents it from being a neutral, a neutral item. They're, they're always somehow 
um, connected either with a, with a uh, you know a mark or, or text on them, as well as linking to other items on the page as well. So I, I found that really really interesting as a scholar that photography is never a neutral documentary source in your work. It's always part of a very complex narrative where you foreground the fact that it is constructive itself. It, it's not in any way a neutral observation. Um, and that brings me to the wonderful photograph that isn't here. Uh, and again, which I think you know I reread your 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 text last night where you superimpose the image of your father and his brother in their communion scene, where you actually superimpose one photograph on the other. I found that an incredibly powerful image of, of um, again, maybe we come to the question of, gen of generational um, intersections, transmissions, complexities. Yeah, I, I mean, I found that, and, it, and, and, and for you, it must have also been extraordinary to put them together and see how much the two photographs actually aligned and a, a complex person emerges, literally a complex third image emerges. Um, that must have been, was, was that a particularly important moment, that one there? Yes, yeah, so those are the two images there. And then you, you, you bring them together, don't you? And you create this, this, this third person or this, this shadowy self, which brings both those figures together. Um, yes, yeah, so again, so photography there was extraordinarily generative, I thought, of complex emotion and complex heritage. Yeah, and that's maybe an example for those moments where I um, worked more intuitively than rationally. I mean, to me, the act of creating art is always a combination of both. I think it shouldn't be, at least for my work, it shouldn't be always entirely intuitive because then, uh, you know, I would, uh, I, would, I would lose control over what I, what I really want to say. Um, and it shouldn't be too controlled because then it would be boring. Um, so uh, I think having achieving a good balance is always the goal. And I think this was an instance where I just played around with these images mm. and suddenly noticed that um, they do create this third figure. I mean, this moment in the story is about my father called Franz Karl, whose brother, who was also called Franz Karl, uh, was a young SS soldier and died in the war in Italy at age 19. And um, my father was born after he died and he was uh, given the same name because his parents hoped that he would basically replace the dead loved brother. And of course, the brother was always perceived as the nicer child, as the braver child. And my father was the one who never listened to his parents and, and um, he could never fulfill that role. And this pressure that laid on him and as you said, rightfully, that the shadow uh, that, uh, you know, I tried to capture this idea of, you know, the, the shadow that was lingering also on, you know, on and within my father of this dead beloved brother. And that it's also a symbol for the shadow of history that, that you know, that we carry around with us and that we need to acknowledge. I mean, I mean, if we maybe move, move towards um, maybe the, 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 the context, the historical context in which you're obviously, you know, um, crafting the, these, these wonderful, this wonderful text, or obviously we're at, we're at a point, aren't we, at a pivot point now where we have the imminent passing of the war generation. Very soon there'll be nobody remaining who was a child, has, a, has you know, is to have a lived experience of the Second World War, moving towards an era of almost certainly complete cultural memory. And I wonder how you think that is impacting on contemporary cultures of representation. I mean, obviously, your text is one extraordinarily rich example of how that imminent passing is impacting on the next generation's relationship with, with this um, seismic time in history. Yeah, you know, obviously we're going through a huge generational shift, both in terms of the um, your generations you're talking about and, and you know, thinking about the Second World War, you know, the people, both the perpetrators and the, you know, survivors dying or disappearing um, and those stories disappearing with them. And of course we need, and I know museums have been doing that for a long time, to rethink how we can keep them alive and how we make them accessible to future generations who are probably also more visually oriented than we are or were. And um, I think the visual plays a huge role in preserving these stories. And, um, you know, whether it's film or illustration or these kind of uh, holograms that they, that they create at museums where you can ask direct questions at projections of survivors um, uh, that were pre-recorded. Um, I think the key here obviously is to think about how we can instill this idea in young people that history is part of who we are, not only part of who we are, but shaped us. And sh you know, we, we never exist outside of uh, our historic and geographical cultural context. We can't, we, we are who we are because of all of these factors. And um, 
I think one of the important ways of doing this is to convey a sense of empathy and to convey these subjects through narratives, through personal narratives, because I, I don't know about the British school education, but in Germany, we just learned a lot about the facts when I was a child. We had a few Holocaust survivors come and talk to us in class, but um, I felt like the personal narrative was not uh, there was not enough focus of, uh, on that and also the relationship to the present uh, wasn't highlighted well enough. So I think what would be important would be to create visual narratives, whether it's films or graphic novels or anything else, um, that convey history as a uh, personal experience. And um, in order to create a, a sense of empathy and understanding, and then of course also, um, uh, you know, make the, the viewer aware that, that they have to also confront themselves with the question of what, what am I doing now in today's society, in my environment to help fight, um, to, to help defend democracy and fight you know, tyrannical systems. Um, I, I think this bridge was not made enough when I was a student. And, and just to, a last thing to add, I mean, this is another thing I only recently realized is that uh, when I went to school in Germany, um, nobody ever asked us about our feelings. We went to, you know, several uh, concentration camp museums in, in, in France, in Germany, in Poland, but at no point did any teacher say, how are you feeling seeing all this? How are you feeling about, you know, being born into this country that committed such horrifying crimes? Of course, you know, other countries have to ask themselves the same questions about their own historic crimes. but. Um, but I think that's also a major mistake, not to confront the subject on an emotional level and only to do it on a factual level in schools. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, I can comment as, as, as a British student. I mean, we, we also it would have been um, it would have been also um, a Eurocentric vision of the Second World War. And my son, who's just gone to uni to do politics, he did history um, at, at 16 here in Wales. Maybe um, one of one of the UK's we might say first colonies, um, and and uh, look at the syllabus today. You would not believe it, Nora. It's all about the home front in Britain and America. It's terribly Anglo-centric, and I and I you know I I do have I do share your concerns and possible reservations that we aren't providing a global enough history. You know, I mean, you know, you know, Europe was not was not the epicenter of everything for the Second World War. There's a much more global picture. So I, I do think that that the visual has, a, because of course it can be wordless, has the ability to open up stories and narratives which, which don't presuppose an ability to connect linguistically with other places as well. It opens up that space. And the image that, 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 that Gida shared there of the, of the very many landscapes that you show, I'm very aware in your novel that those are your feelings, partly those landscapes, that, those landscape pictures, they, they exude an, an emotive atmosphere, which is not progressing the action of the story, but it's giving me a very strong sense of the emotional tenor of your drawing and uh, that of the narrator and the story. So I very much felt that your landscapes held your held the emotions. I don't know if that's, if that's what you intended. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are a lot of landscape photographs in the, in the book. And um, I, I mean, on the one hand, I, I, I went to flea markets in Germany to, to think about, you know, what are recurring motifs? in these photographs from between the turn of the century to today. What do Germans and half Germans photographed? And I started seeing these recurring motifs of, uh, you know, people in, in forests, people crossing rivers, people climbing mountains. And also um, or, uh, another recurring motif was that of people from behind looking at landscapes, which I haven't done the same flea market research in other countries, but it appears to me to be very closely related to German Romanticism mm -hmm. and Caspar David Friedrich and so forth. And um, so I collected, I started collecting these images. So to me, those landscapes were both a cultural investigation and my trying to understand who, who am I? Uh, what, who are we as a people? Um, you know, despite globalism and all that, I, I, I do think we have to ask ourselves, who are we? As, as a people and culturally, because cultural identity exists no matter how global we are and no matter how open we are, we can't pretend we live outside of our cultural context. I mean, our entire worldview and what you're saying about the education on, on, about World War I and II shows that, proves that, that oh, yes. it's, it's very narrow. And, um, and so we have to confront this, you know, the fact that we're deeply, deeply immersed in our cultures 
And I tried to find visual proof for that. But then I also use these photographs as an emotional canvas, exactly like you said, I, because I, I found the idea boring of just showing me, uh, you know, in every, had I turned it into a more traditional graphic novel, many of which I admire, but it's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to, I wanted to avoid showing myself in every panel yeah. looking sad or, you know, looking surprised. It, it just felt too direct and not very poetic. And I try to therefore create passive portraits or, or inner portraits um, by illustrating my feelings through landscapes. I, I, mean, I, I, think, I think that's so powerful because I mean, you also have those postcards of Florida as well. So we, we do travel. It's a very transnational novel. So I, I, I can totally, I totally, you know, um, uh, concur with, with, the, with the, the extraordinarily, the, the depth of analysis of German is. It's also very transnational. We do travel a lot with your, from Italy to America, to Florida, to New York. And we look at your accent. I, I love your page where we see your mouth and your, your sense of, of your accent the trace of yourself in your words and the sound of your voice. And I, and I think that's so important that you're very embedded. You're not necessarily there as a full figure, like I'm seeing you now, but I feel you everywhere, but in a way, um, as, as, a, as a holistic experience, you know, not just your life experience as a German, but the experience maybe of a generation and of a, of a, of a group of people who are, who are trying to connect together such a disparate map of the self. I don't know if, that would, if that's a fair estimation, but when I, when I read it, that's what I really, much really felt. So it's about being German, it's also about being of a generation um, of which I probably share the same as yourself, which is, you know, I, I also grapple with the British narrative, which is one of the victory story, which is utter, utterly flawed. <laughs> so, you know, that there are multiple, I think we're all grappling with, with heritages that, that have been gifted to us by people without our, not at our request. And then um, that's difficult. Yeah, and we're usually not even aware of it uh, unless, I mean, that's why when you leave your own country, you suddenly understand how narrow your own perspective is. I mean, I'm confronted with that still after 20 years of living abroad uh, every day when I leave the house in Brooklyn and I talk to somebody, I live in a Caribbean neighborhood and then, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I'm always shocked at my own limited, you know, perspective still after so many years. <laughs> So it's, uh, yeah, but also what you said about this being about a generation, I, I think the goal was always to make this book not only about myself and my family and about being German, but that there's a collective element. Um, you know, I think the personal and the connect collective are deeply tied in with each other. I think you can't separate them, but they also have individual um, characteristics in a way. Um, and so my hope was always that the book could be understood beyond my own experience and take on a life and meaning of itself. And I've noticed that when I'm giving talks in other countries that it does resonate with people who feel, as you just said, you know, most countries, I mean, Germany is probably an exception in terms of our growing up feeling uh, no national pride at all, which is also a problem and which can, uh, you know, which can lead to a very complex difficult results if, if you're not careful. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, countries probably try to suppress the more the darker moments in their histories. It's certainly true for the United States. And you were just talking about colonialism. I mean, it's- Oh, yes. I mean, it, it's, most countries haven't even addressed that. And you're right. I mean, the Second World War and the First World War, people in colonies were involved, they fought they, they, they died for us, uh, for our countries, and we are, we're not even acknowledging it. And, you know, the history of slavery, that is not really over because there is so much racism and, and there's a direct connection and continuation. Um, and so I think, um, I think that these conversations have to be had and that every country has their own, its own responsibility to face every aspect of their past. And that does not mean that they can't love their country. That is something that I think is so hard for people to understand is that you can confront the difficult moments in your past and still love your country. In fact, you can only fully embrace it if you take an honest you know, look, look at it. Uh, you can't just embrace certain moments in history of your country. I mean, you, you, have, you are given this heritage that combines all sorts of moments. Mm. I mean, and that, I mean, that brings us maybe towards the latter part of our, of our conversation before the Q&A from Colin. So please do put questions in the chat, Colin, if you'd like to ask Nora a question. Um, it, it's really about, it's about the form. And, and, you know, you have given us here a history that is graphically presented. 
a, a graphic novel, I'm not sure if that's the word that you would use, but graphically presented. And it, it's very much story in war. And I wonder who were the influences on you, whether, whether it came from the graphic and comics community, it may not have done, or maybe it comes from other artistic traditions. And you've already alluded to some of those in general romanticism. I'm sure there's a very strong portraiture um, tradition that I, I find in, the read, in reading your, your, your text. But I wonder what your influences were and why the graphic format was the one that you felt was the most a tune and a collage effect that you've talked about to what you wanted to say. I don't know if you want to just maybe give us your insights into, into that, into, as it were, the influences and the, the intertexts that play into your work. Yeah, I think there are many influences. I'm not always uh, aware of them as I create the work, but I know they're there. I mean, uh, German expressionism is, is a very big in influence, both in terms of the visual representation, but also the subject matter. I mean, People like George Gross and Otto Dix, you know, documented uh, the wars and uh, also had a general basic pacifist attitude. So that, uh, you know, that's a, a group of people that I feel a connection to. Um, and, you know, other other influences too from, from different cultures. I mean, I'm very uh, influenced also by traditional Japanese woodblock prints, you know, just in terms of the graphic quality and the way that they combine text and image as one graphic unity. Um, the encyclopedic pages we showed earlier also, um, uh, I was influenced by some of these uh, Indian charts, educational charts, illustrated charts for children. Um, so there's a whole variety of influences there, but what, me, what also influenced me while I was researching the book was, um, um, doc were documentary films, and specifically those that have an essayistic quality to them, where the filmmaker is as much a subject of the film as the subject they portray. And um, I mean, two examples would be Werner Herzog, the German filmmaker, and also um, Joshua Oppenheimer, uh, the American filmmaker who made The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, which are both so skillfully done and so beautiful, but never uh, slip into the sentimental. And that's also something I was struggling with. And that was important to me that I use images that convey emotion, but they don't, don't convey a sense of sentimentality or nostalgia because that's a very difficult tone. You know, it's a, that wouldn't be the right tone for a book about the war told through the perspective of a German. And, and again, we've talked a little bit about, about you know, the change in contemporary era. And, and, I, and I wonder also, you talked about decolonizing the curriculum, particularly in the UK today, Black Lives Matters. Do you think that, and again, we did have a brief discussion before we came on, we came on air as it were, you know, what, what might a fourth generation image be? I mean, I'm really intrigued by as the ripple gets further out, you know, from, from the centre point at which, you know, the, the, the pebble falls. I wonder, I wonder what you think, um, you know, as we go forward, those after us might start, how they might start to, to reflect and imagine whether they might be more of a, you know, you know like a multi-directional memory approach, the transnational might take a greater force, definitely maybe um, a, a fuller understanding of the global, the, well, the global nature of, um, of the war in the Pacific and elsewhere. I don't, I don't know if you have any, just again, I'm being really quite speculative here, a, a sense of where, of where a fourth generation might, might start to, to investigate in their own way as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do think that there's a much more global perspective, obviously, partly because of the movements that we're going through politically, environmentally, um, uh, you know, the, the, the right wing, uh, extreme right wing sentiments that are popping up, the tyrannical systems, both in the West and the East. Um, uh, yeah, the, the environmental shift, uh, the confrontation of racism and, and uh, history of slavery and, and col colonies. So I think there are many global issues that young people are much more aware of than they than maybe we were, and I'm sure that art schools and you know that that, that new visual work will be produced from that. Um, but that being said, of course, there is also a tradition already with people like Emery Douglas, uh, who was you know graph or he, he is a graphic art artist who was in the Black Panther mo movement. Um, but uh, hopefully, the new generation will will be able to, to draw from that kind of work, but, but yeah, put a fresh perspective on it. I mean, I, I hope that, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I worry about political lethargy. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, my sense at the moment is that, that uh, young people are more politically oriented than maybe even eight years ago, but um, it's hard to predict how that's going to develop. I mean, obviously schools play a major part in that education. Mm. Uh, how do your students in New York today, how do they respond to your work? 
do they, are they, I'm assuming they, they are they're aware of your of your professional uh, career as well. How do they respond to your work? Your American students that inter- that would interest me. Do they have a, a res- particular responses or interests or comments? It's interesting because uh, I also taught at a university in Germany prior to coming to the United States and. The system is so different there in that it almost feels like a master class. So, you know, students sign up with a professor because they admire that person's work. In America, that's pretty much discouraged for good reasons. You know, professors are not, I mean, there's no rule against it, but the sense is that you shouldn't show your own work to your students. Uh, I mean, at least not, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, so I, I, I don't actually know how many students are fully aware of the work. I mean, sadly, the work that the teachers are doing. <laughs> and sometimes they don't even remember their teachers' names. But I mean, some of them certainly are. And uh, I have had students over the years who became very uh, invested in creating nonfiction visual work, partly because of the work I'm doing. And it's very satisfying because of the reasons that are outlined in my previous answer, which is, I think we need a new generation of visual artists to create political work. I mean, to me, that's really, there are so many problems in the world and so little time that I, I, I hope that there will be people who address them visually too, because we need those people to create this level of empathy. And, you know, illustration is, helps you gain emotional access to subjects that you might otherwise not feel like you can access in the same way. Thank you. I think we're beginning to get some questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to, to take the questions, uh, Guido, or whether you want myself and, and Nora just to, to view them ourselves and respond, you know, live. How, how would you like to, to organise that? As, as we prefer. So I'm very happy to take the, the questions if they come in. But then if you want to directly reply to the, to the chat, uh, please go. You can, you, can, you can go ahead. I, I, I would have a question for, for Nora, too. But... Uh, Mm. Go, go for it. You got chairs prerogative. Okay, okay. So I mean, I will take the, the right of the chair to ask the first question. I mean, and then I, I, I saw in any case. I mean, there are some comments in the chat, so then we can move to to answer to that. And and please to all the audience. I mean, and the members of the audience, you please ask questions in the chat or raise your hand. We are here for that for twenty minutes. But so I, I would like to to ask Nora. I mean, about um, the. If you could reflect a bit more and expand on the idea of guilt and the sense of, of, of guilt that you described at first, in the sense that uh, if for those that read your book, I mean, your work is uh, it, it, this, this feeling, I mean, uh, emerges so, so strongly and then you, you, you are able to describe it so polite, po- po- poetically and integrated it in, in, this, in, in the overall development of, of, of the book. But so it's clear, I mean, that this emotional uh, and generational sense of guilt towards the past is what really set in motion your uh, your quest for for knowledge for understanding better your, your family history and so i would like to know um, since in uh, many other contexts instead guilt was did not become a central feeling in uh, uh, addressing the past like for example i work on italian culture and italian culture you know uh, to complete the opposite direction uh, developing every possible strategy to diverge and ignore any form of guilt and so, for example, in my own perspective, I think we in a place like Italy, where guilt was so much uh, at some little importance, we should have more guilt. And I would like to, to know your reflection coming from the German context in which instead German, sorry, guilt was so central, uh, what you found positive on it and perhaps also what you found negative. So if you could expand and reflect yeah. on, on this. I mean, guilt is obviously a word that people don't like because it assumes that we should feel guilty. And there are many Germans today who feel that way too, who, um, you know, who don't feel like we should dwell on these feelings and, you know, it's not us who committed the crime. So why should we feel guilty? Um, To me, I just wanted to point out, um, I mean, I do think it's something that's on the, at least on the back of the minds of many, many Germans, even if they're not realizing it, I think the war is still so present in the way we act today, in the way we speak, in the laws that we create, in the way that the police force reacts to certain uh, situations. I mean, it's, it's so central to the way that German culture functions and society functions. So we can't pretend we're freed from it. Um, but to me, the guilt is not so much something that I feel like I should feel. It's just a reflex. I mean, and again, a reflex that I feel much more strongly abroad than in Germany. Uh, I mean, Hannah Arendt once said, uh, where everybody's guilty, no one feels 
guilty. I mean, I'm probably not phrasing it correctly, but um, the, the truth is that I only felt this guilt when I left Germany. I mean, I live in a city, New York, where, uh, you know, most European refugees arrived to from, from Nazi Germany, many of whom stayed here. When I talk German to my parents on the phone and I walk through a Hasidic neighborhood, or I sit next to somebody on the subway who hears me speak German, of course, I feel how could I not feel affected by this clash of histories and generations in that moment? But I wouldn't know that if I take a subway in Berlin, where most of the, my the fellow passengers are, are Christian Germans. Uh, so I, I think it's it's a reflex, it's a natural reflex. Um, but and, and also the goal of the book was never to overcome the guilt, but to try to deal with it more constructively, because on the negative subject, uh, I felt as a child and, and a teenager learning about the war and the Holocaust, I really felt stifled and paralyzed. Uh, I mean, I felt like it was important that we learned about it, but I also didn't know what to do with this feeling. And again, the, parent, uh, the, the, the teachers didn't uh, ask us about our feelings. So um, that made me feel helpless and that's not the right educational approach. And so um, the goal of the book was to, to try to build a more natural relationship to my feelings of guilt, not to overcome it, but to deal with it in a more constructive way. And uh, as, you, as you say, I mean, I think in that way, the guilt actually led to a positive result, which was a deeper engagement with our past. Yeah, and if I can add, in, in your case, it's also led to a positive result for the, the beauty of the artistic work we produced. And indeed, indeed art, I think, can, can really help, I mean, to, to engage, as you said, in more fruitful ways that are not uh, paralyzing us, I mean, in front of the heavy burden. But so uh, we, we have also the other comments, I mean, and so uh, I think uh, they are quite quick, so I will just uh, uh, read them. So uh, who was it? So yeah. Uh, Eline asked you, ask if you could uh, explain the role that uh, David Frederick's paintings uh, had for you, so the, the influence of Frederick. And, 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 though, and then at the beginning, uh, Joe Rickler uh, made a comment I mean, about the fact that after being in the UK for 40 years, he could still be identified for his accent as an other, he's from uh, uh, Canada. And so uh, he would like to know if you experienced still these forms of othering uh, in, uh, in, in your life to, today. Sorry, could you repeat the second question? The, um, if, 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 sorry, if, I don't misunderstand it. Yeah, sorry, if you, if you, if you still experience the, a, sem, the, a sense of uh, appearing an, a, as an other to, to, to other people in the United States because of your uh, accent. Oh, okay. And, uh, and yeah. And I just thought that this connects also to the pages in your book in which you also show the kind of, uh, I mean, the prejudice that uh, uh, many people could have and still have with, with Germans uh, yeah. bringing up the Holocaust, I mean, even just in a, as a joke in a certain uh, cases as an association of mind. Yeah. Yeah. So the Caspar David Friedrich question, um, while I'm not, uh, you know, influenced by his entire body of work necessarily, there was the central uh, painting that probably many people uh, know uh, of a man stand I mean I, I changed the colors in my book but um, a man standing on a on a hill looking at a, a sea of fog as it's referred to in the title of the painting um, and I you know echoed this on my cover um, and for me it was as I mentioned earlier it was really a gaze backwards um, you know to the past uh, to another country um, and uh, also a gaze inward, a confrontation with myself and my family. And I, 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 it's, it's became a recurring motif throughout the whole book. So this is again myself where I talk about how German I suddenly felt after having lived um, abroad for so long. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I collected these photographs of people um, in landscapes from behind, which became to me the symbol of um, this inner confrontation, but also this idea that somebody is watching me as I do this, you know, this thought that I have a responsibility that because other people, you know, the world is watching, constantly watching Germany uh, in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and always in relationship to the war. And again, I feel like, you know, it's good that they do that, but 
we should do that with all other countries in the world too, because you know we all had had dark moments in our history, um, and that really leads into the second question too, um, where I think um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that um, negative stereotypes about Germans are still so present. I mean, I I, I do think Germans, you know, we have to also acknowledge that there are new right wing extremist tendencies also in Germany and. You know, the Alternative für Deutschland is a right wing party that has become popular over the last year. So um, I'm not saying that we know how to do things in Germany. Dem democracy is always a process and we, the Germans, haven't figured out, you know, how to preserve it. We don't we don't have the key to that to that knowledge. We have to work on it, too. But I think uh, I'm always aware of, you know, I feel other. I always I, I feel different when I'm confronted with these negative stereotypes in public situations, but also in the entertainment industry, you know, German speaking in martial tones and so forth. Um, so that still makes me feel disconnected. And, you know, my accent, I think it really depends on what context I'm in. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, when I'm walking through a, a, a an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, and, and, I, and I just know, you know, my grandparents could have theoretically killed this person's grandparents. I can't avoid feeling different. But New York is also such a complex place and everybody's different that, you know, that, that makes you not feel different because you don't really have to fit in because there's nothing to fit into. I mean, of course, there are more uh, dominant, you know, groups and, and more vulnerable groups, but, um, you know, it, it's just different from immersing yourself in a, in a very, um, what's it called, unified uh, cultural context. Makes sense, yes. So uh, we actually have several questions now, so we'll just read a few of them and then feel free to, to address them as long as you want. So uh, Silvia Vari asked, how does the comic medium interact with your migrant background? Does its heterogeneous form add anything to the narration of the experience of migration based on your experience. And then, uh, yeah, if you want to reply, yeah, please, Nora. Go. Maybe I forget otherwise. Um, it's, uh, that's a very interesting question. I had not specifically thought about that. I mean, what I had thought about is what I pointed out earlier in terms of the book being about an, an, an inner journey and a geographical journey going back to Germany physically. Um, and, and I tried to convey it through that form, scrapbook form, um, and, I, I, and I'm sure that the m m migration uh, question is in there too, uh, because I'm bringing in different visual elements from different time periods and different cultural contexts. So uh, that's a very interesting question that I probably should think about more. And two other questions are about Germany today. Uh, so uh, one, Judith asked, if, do, you, do you think that the feeling of guilt would change if you move, move back to Germany now? And then another question still about Germany was about the reception of your work in Germany, if there were differences with uh, the international or American reception of, of, the, uh, of your memoir. Okay, uh, that's an interesting question about uh, whether my, it's about my guilt probably, right? Whether my feeling of guilt would change if I moved back. Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, uh, Maybe I should start with the second question because the first one ties into it in a way. The book was received very, very well in Germany um, because I think many Germans identify with it, obviously. Um, and I think many Germans uh, struggle with the idea of confronting their family histories because they don't know how to, how to begin. And like me, they learn about the, the Nazi regime, you know, in a very factual way, but they but they don't really know how to deal with the personal stuff. And I think my book to some Germans has been seen as a, as a guide towards how one can do that. I mean, I often get emails from people who say that they've also now embarked on their family history. And I think that's partly why it was, um, it was so successful there. Um, and, uh, you know, because I, I have, I mean, when I go back to Germany for lectures or events, I take on that role of, you know, a German who has confronted our past. And so that, that ties into the first question. And in that regard, I do feel a strong sense of responsibility when I go to Germany, because I'm in this role as the author who has done that. Um, 
But at the same time, I think as a private human being, I mean, I'm always shocked at how, uh, how easily and quickly one does adapt to new social situations. I mean, whenever I spend you know, several weeks in Germany, at the beginning, I'm always confronted with these cultural clashes because I'm not so familiar anymore with the way people ask questions and talk to each other. It's, it's just very different than in the United States. And then after several weeks, I've gotten used to it and I've shifted back towards that, uh, that way of being a German in a German society. And then when I come here, I'm, I'm always experiencing the opposite effect where again, I'm going through a cultural shock. Um, and, and so I, 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 on a personal level, I could imagine that I would um, feel less guilty. You know, I, I probably would feel safer in a way. I mean, it's, it's not a, I don't mean that, that word in a positive sense necessarily. It's, it's, a, it's an excuse, you know, the collective is also something you can hide behind. And that's the problem with collective guilt is that you can always leave it up to the institutions and then you feel like you've done your homework and that's it. Um, and I could see how I could slip into that just because of my experience of how easily adaptable. I mean, I think it's a survival instinct. I mean, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight it and we shouldn't try to control it and confront it. But I think it's something that happens automatically because we have to fit in and some, to some degree in order to survive. No, no, but it makes perfect sense. And I, I would just add, I mean, that for sure is the danger to develop the feeling of having done the work. And so this is, can be done for good, but at the same time, it's still better to, I think, to, to try to do this work rather than uh, look in another direction and, and try to conceal these parts. And so there are other people working in other cultural contexts, like Shreya, Shreya Sangai, who works on the Kashmir conflict. And would like to ask you if, did you experience moments of not being able to look at the images of violence and the difficult emotions they caused? Did you feel burdened both by the past and the new information you were coming across in the present? And how did you tackle these this feelings, this difficult situation in, in your work? Um, yeah, again, a very important question. Uh, I'm really uh, a proponent of looking and seeing. And uh, I think we have a responsibility to look at violent images. I mean, violent images that are documentary uh, and not sensational, obviously, um, because it, we owe it to the people in the pictures not to forget. And I often think, you know, what if nobody had documented what happened uh, in the Holocaust? What, what sense would you have, it, ha would we have of it today? I mean, our sense of it would be so much more limited if it were just based on words and descriptions. And I think we need to look at these photographs or of any other photographs of genocide of course, it's not a, a pleasant experience. And of course, I felt burdened. I mean, I often did this research late at night, right before going to bed. Um, but then my initial thought was always, well, I feel burdened. But what about the person who was actually going through this, whose life was, was destroyed who's, and, and whose family's identity over generations was destroyed? I mean, and I am shying away from looking at them. I just... I. I, I feel like we need to look, um, and I, I think I've, I've developed a certain, I mean, it's not that I've come, I've become, you know, they've become sterile to me. I mean, I've, 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 I think I've developed a kind of, I brace myself physically before I look at them, and I try to look at them as objectively as I can. Um, and I think it's just, it's just tremendously important. And there are also so many images that, by the way, have not made it to the uh, to the light of uh, of I don't know what the phrase is public no um, you know because they are censored by the military for instance mm -hmm. I mean for instance there are very few uh, images that we can look at that show the effect of the atomic bombs dropped by the Americans in in um, uh, in Japan uh, and why because the American you know military doesn't want us to uh, criticize that decision. And still today, we see only when you Google Hiroshima, all you, most of the images you see are of destroyed buildings. We don't see many of people. And there's a reason for that, and it's wrong. And uh, the same, I mean, we know this about, you know, photographs of soldiers, dead soldiers coming back into our countries. We hardly see any of that. And then also there's a fascinating book called The, the Censored War, which was published by Yale University Press. 
And it talks about the images taken by the US military during the Second World War that never made it out to the public because they portrayed the military in a negative light. So for instance, photographs of African-American soldiers who basically had to do all the dirty work, you know, who had to remove dead bodies while the white soldiers didn't. Um, and, you know, why don't we want them to be seen? Because we don't want to be seen as racist. And still we are racist and, and we should see these things. We should understand the tra historic trajectory of where these perceptions and, and, and stereotypical notions come from. And, um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, looking means... Uh, apparently on the very last moment, we had a problem with Nora's connection. Doesn't seem to be here anymore. No, I can't, I can't see her either, Guido. That no. was an extraordinary no. moment of looking and somehow we can't look anymore because Nora disappeared. Um, no, wait, wait, she's, she's, I saw her, I saw her. She's coming back, wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. she's back. I'm sorry, oh. am I no problem, no. Uh, sometimes does this, sorry. <laughs> okay, that was intense, it was a great reply, thanks a lot. I, I, I think we have time for one last question. I mean, now I don't have the chat to open, so I don't remember the person that posed it, but someone uh, brought about that very fascinating part of your book in which uh, uh, images and figures break up the text. And so you need to move from left to right to continue to, to read. And so she pointed out that this uh, forced the reader to slow down in the reading process. And she would like to know if that was your intention when you structure the, the image in that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm just showing one example here where you have to read across the face to, uh, to get the sentence. Um, it wasn't, I don't think it was a conscious decision, but one reviewer at the New York Times pointed that out once. And then I realized that there's truth to it, that, um, you know, a visual book, because the, it's interesting, people often think that visual books make reading easier. And I think that's because we have this idea that visual books are only for children and children need help understanding texts. But we are, I mean, adults are highly visual people, you know, before the, uh, I mean, I mean, a hundred years ago, and, and not only since a hundred years ago, did we start illustrating books with photographs or, you know, not having any text. I mean, books for adults used to always be illustrated from the beginning of, of bookmaking. And um, images have effect, have an emotional effect on adults too, of course. Um, but, uh, but I think, so I think they don't make reading easier. They don't make it easier to understand content, but they can actually add depth. And in that way, they can inform the understanding, you know, they can recontextualize the, the text in a deeper way. Um, but they don't make it quicker to understand the content. Um, and, I, and I do like that idea that, um, you know, the, the breaking up the text in a way makes the person who's written about, makes us look at them more closely. And it's a form of paying respect to that person's story. Thanks. So it's one minute past six o'clock. I don't know if, if Claire, if you would like to, to add a conclusive thought or add something or... I just, want, I just want to conclude by saying thank you, Nora, for such a uh, wonderfully self-reflective and honest, but also deeply intellectually vibrant analysis of your own work. It's not easy to be a, a critic of your own production. And I say it's been, it's been wonderfully illuminating that both the conscious and the unconscious processes that, 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 brought, you know, brought, that have been brought to bear on this wonderful piece of work. So thank you very much for such an incisive and, and thoughtful, reflective piece about your own practice. It's been really, really wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for, for having me and for listening. I think everyone will come back home. I mean, we are all, all home. In any case, I mean, we'll bring back, I mean, lots of ideas, I mean, from uh, your uh, conversation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So I, I would like just to thank yeah, the two participants and uh, thank the audience as well for being here because it's, that's the most important part. I mean, to communicate uh, the works done in academia, I mean, in a broad community, and at least, I mean, now the online uh, uh, remote events allows, allows us to, to connect uh, all across the world, and this is a, a positive side of uh, the recent development, I mean, at least, at least there is this positive side. And so uh, I would like to thank everyone, and I will just stop the recording and uh, end the event. <laughs>